Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 863 for March 21st, 2021. Coming up in a few minutes. Look at everything on your desk, on the wall, on the floor, and all of it is a result of a chemical process. And the fact that all of this physicality around us is the result of chemistry is a very sculptural. I mean, it's classical sculpture in its uh, purest form. So for me, it is very much that. Um, we're looking to create these little blocks of flavor in terms of different spirit characters, different fermentations. We, we're creating, I guess, like a spice rack of building blocks and then get to remix them and, and rejig them and rearrange them. Laura Hemi is not talking about making whiskey, but about her early career as an art student. But that training has served her well in her whiskey career. She's the distillery manager for Diageo's Rowan Co. Distillery in Dublin, Ireland. And you'll hear more of my conversation with her later on WhiskeyCast in depth. I'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice behind the label, and... So it's been fun. It's time for us to choose another apprentice. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Trying to fit the best of Ireland into one day, huh? Hmm. Good luck. Takes us at least 12 years. Happy St. Patrick's Day from Redbreast. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Hey, whiskey fans, I'm Gabriel Cartarella, brand ambassador for the world's most awarded blended scotch whiskey, Jewers. You could probably guess I've got a lot of stories, but for me, the good ones have one thing in common. They're best told over a glass of whiskey. So hit pause, grab your bottle of Jewers, and let's get back to this episode of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. Look for the U.S. to start making some moves on its tariffs targeting imported steel and aluminum soon. That's because U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai has now taken on her new post in the Biden administration following her Senate confirmation vote this week. Those tariffs have had a critical impact on the U.S. whiskey industry since they were imposed by the Trump administration back in 2018. That move led to the European Union and Great Britain targeting imports of bourbon and other American whiskeys with a 25% tariff. Not only has that slashed U.S. whiskey exports to Europe, but the tariff is scheduled to double to 50% on June 1st, unless there is a resolution on the steel and aluminum debate. Ambassador Tai told senators during her confirmation hearings that the steel and aluminum issue will be a priority for her team. Brown Foreman is betting that the tariffs will be removed soon. The company has announced plans for a major expansion at the Woodford Reserve Distillery in Versailles, Kentucky. While there have been other projects at Woodford over the last 25 years, this is one of the few that will focus on the distillery's historic stillhouse, which dates back to the original Lebro and Graham distillery around 1818. There will be three new pot stills and additional fermenters that should double the distillery's production capacity. In addition, the project also includes new grain and barrel handling facilities and an employee training center. Janet Patton of the Lexington Herald-Leader was first on this story and reported work on the expansion is expected to be complete next summer. A Brown Foreman spokesman declined to give us a price tag for the project, except to say that it's, quote, many, many millions, and that the distillery will remain open throughout construction. It's not likely to be as many millions as the $96 million dollars Brown Foreman is spending to expand its flagship distillery on the west side of Louisville, though. Meanwhile, the UK government is making almost 9 million pounds of additional funding available to distilleries in Scotland to help fund projects that will help cut carbon emissions. Twelve projects are eligible for the funding after being selected in the first round of the program, including projects at Highland Park, Brooklady, and Inchdarney distilleries. 
Most of the projects focus on ways to reduce the amount of fossil fuels used for generating heat. That accounts for around 80% of the energy use at distilleries. Turning now to heat of another kind, the type lawyers generate. The Scotch Whiskey Association and White and Mackay have filed a lawsuit against a British Columbia distillery for suggesting that its whiskies are Scottish in nature. The suit was filed in the British Columbia Supreme Court against Victoria-based Macaloney's Caledonian Distillery. We've reported on founder Graham Macaloney's story many times over the last decade as he sought to build his own distillery. He's a native Scotsman now bottling his own whiskies after several years of selling whiskey imported from Scotland. And while he has changed the branding for his distillery's whiskies, he has also emphasized the distillery's Scottish heritage, including using the term traditionally made by Scots on the distillery's website and describing its whiskey as a, quote, island whiskey. Retired Diageo Scotch distillery manager Mike Nicholson is the master distiller, and the late Dr. Jim Swan was a consultant on the Vancouver Island project for several years. Graham has not responded to our email seeking his side of the story, and his lawyers have not yet filed their response to the lawsuit. Elsewhere on the court docket, there's a dispute between Kentucky's two black-owned distilleries that has led to a federal lawsuit. At stake, which one can legitimately claim to be the first, quote, black-owned bourbon distillery in Kentucky? The Yarborough Brothers on Louisville's Bro Brothers Distillery and their Victory Global Holding Company is suing Sean and Tia Edwards, the owners of Lexington-based Fresh Bourbon, for false advertising. Fresh Bourbon claims in its marketing to be, quote, recognized by the state of Kentucky as the first African Americans to make Kentucky bourbon that were not slaves, and cites a Kentucky State Senate resolution to back that up. While Fresh Bourbon was founded in December of 2017, and has plans in the works to build a distillery in Lexington. Those plans were delayed last year because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and Fresh Bourbon's initial releases are being sourced from another distillery in the state. The Arboro brothers cite in that lawsuit that Fresh Bourbon has not been issued federal or state distillery permits for their project, while the Bro Brothers Distillery in Louisville has been operating since December. The lawsuit was filed in U.S. District Court in Louisville. The Edwards have not yet responded to the suit, though Sean Edwards told the Louisville Courier-Journal that they stand behind their story. It's been almost a year now since Uncle Nearest Tennessee Whiskey and Jack Daniels owner Brown Foreman unveiled the Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative. That program builds on the friendship between Jack Daniel and Nearest Green, the enslaved man who taught Jack Daniel how to make whiskey before the Civil War, and then went on to work alongside Jack Daniel as his first head distiller after the war. The program's three elements include The three elements of the program include a support program for black spirits entrepreneurs along with training for people of color within the industry to prepare them for careers as master distillers. Longtime Glenfiddich brand ambassador Tracy Franklin was the first person in that program, and she's been working most recently with Sagamore Spirit Distillery in Baltimore. Uncle Nearest founder Fawn Weaver gave us an update on the initiative during a recent Happy Hour webcast. I want to say this is maybe her third or fourth distillery that she is apprenticing at during this, but she's one. And then Byron Copeland is down at Jack Daniel distillery. So he has been working there and I like keeping up with him on social media because he posts all of his little things of what he's doing. So it's been fun. It's time for us to choose another apprentice. And so we've all been talking about that. Matt Blevins, who 
heads up all of the the global brand for Jack Daniels was at my house last week for coffee and we were talking about okay who's the next who's the next uh, brand in the business incubation program which is essentially us coming alongside black owned spirit brands and and lifting them up sort of pulling as we climb if you would and and so we were looking at that and saying okay here are the next two that we think are good for the program and who's the next apprentice and how do we bring the distributors in because if I would venture to say that the whitest, most male part of our industry is not actually the supplier. It's the distributors. And so oh, yeah. how do and so much of our so much of our so many of our team members, especially on the side, the, the sales side is coming from the distributor. And so if the, the pathway into the supplier side of the business to the Uncle Nearest and the, the Diageos and everyone else, if the natural sort of route that people go is from being a bartender to then working for the distributor, to then working to the supplier. Well, if the distributors are white male and that's, you know, predominantly across the board, well, then we've got a bit of a a problem we need to sort out. And so that has become a a conversation as of late. How do we bring them into the Nearson Jack Advancement Initiative to figure out how can we help to diversify the third, that, that third tier, right? Well, I guess they're the second tier, but it's still a part of our three tier system. How do we do that? The third part of the program is the proposed Nearest Green School of Distilling at Motlow State Community College's campus near Lynchburg, Tennessee, and it's largely on hold right now because of the pandemic. Motlow State has been offering online-only classes and has not yet added the distilling program to its offerings. We'll keep you posted. The Scotch whiskey documentary The Water of Life is making its Australian debut next week. There's an online and in-person screening in conjunction with Cape Byron Distillery near Brisbane. Of course, Jim McEwen is featured in the film. He's been working with Cape Byron's owners, the Brook family, for several years now, first on gin and now on whiskey. The film includes some of Jim's work at Cape Byron two years ago, when they ran their first whiskey spirit through the stills. And that April 1st event will give Australians a chance to taste that whiskey for the first time. Unfortunately, tasting kits will not be available outside of Australia. We have a link for more details on the screening in our show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. Of course, that's where you can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long. Don't forget to join us for the Happy Hour live webcast each Friday night at 5 p.m. New York time, 2100 GMT right now during daylight time. Udo Sontag worked with Jim McEwen on his new memoir, A Journeyman's Journey. We had some technical problems with Udo a couple of weeks ago when he was scheduled to join us on the webcast. Those have been fixed now, and he'll be with us this week. If you missed this past Friday night's live webcast with Gordon Bruce of Scotland's Knock Do Distillery, the replay is available on demand at the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel. Time now for the WhiskeyCast calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. With some parts of the world hunkering down because of another wave of COVID-19, we are seeing some event plans change. In Australia, Whiskey Live organizers have postponed their Melbourne event from May 7th and 8th until the weekend of September 17th and 18th. And Edel Dropper, the Noble Drops Festival in Stavanger, Norway, has been postponed from May 29th until August 21st. The Beer, Bourbon, and Barbecue Festival, scheduled for this coming weekend in Wilmington, North Carolina, had already been postponed. It has now been rescheduled for November 13th. Events that are taking place either virtually or in person, McTeers has its next auction of rare whiskeys this Friday in Glasgow, Scotland. Tickets are still available for the Fredericksburg Whiskey and Wine Fest, this Saturday in Fredericksburg, Texas. The Whiskey Exchange has a virtual tasting of the McAllen's Editions range on March 31st, 
and Teeling Whiskey Company in Dublin has a virtual whiskey and chocolate pairing on April 1st. The Whiskey Obsession Festival will take place in Tampa, Florida, April 8th. The One Glass Festival at Festivalen is still on the calendar for April 16th and 17th in Oslo, Norway. And the Nth Universal Whiskey Experience is on for April 20th and 21st in Las Vegas. Remember, all in-person events are still subject to change on short notice, depending on local public health restrictions. We are updating the calendar at WhiskeyCast.com throughout the week as we get word on event changes and new additions to the festival schedule. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states and three continents, and online, too. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Gabriel Cartarella again, the doer's guy. I've seen a lot in my years as a brand ambassador for the world's most awarded blended scotch. Like the time I got to host a doer's tasting for some members of a major European royal family. Now, I'm not going to say which one, but they did invite me to come stay at their castle. Pretty cool, right? Well, here's another story for you. In 2019, our master blender, Stephanie McLeod, became the first woman to be awarded Master Blender of the Year by the International Whiskey Competition. And a year after that, she won it again. Stephanie's first creation for Dewar's, Dewar's 15 year, is another piece of history. Sweet, floral, with notes of honey and toffee, a perfectly balanced addition to the Dewar's lineup. It's a great introduction to scotch for beginners, and it's more than complex enough to satisfy whiskey aficionados. So grab some Dewar's 15, call some friends, and make a few stories of your own. That's what a good bottle of whiskey is all about. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by the Distiller's Edition Collection. Is making whiskey an art or a science? At its very core, distillation is one of humanity's oldest chemical processes, but people have been making whiskey for hundreds of years without formal training in chemistry. It's not that hard to make whiskey, but to make a good whiskey? That's where the art comes in, knowing just which flavors and aromas work well together and how to create them in the spirit. So it is fair to say that making whiskey is both an art and a science. Laura Hemi's career has taken her through both disciplines, on her way to becoming the distillery manager at Diageo's Rowan Co. Distillery in Dublin. She helped lead the team that turned the old power plant at the Guinness St. James's Gate Brewing Complex into a distillery. I caught up with her this week via Zoom on an unusual springtime day in Dublin. We've actually got a very rare sunny day in Dublin, um, so it's actually lovely. When the sun's out, it's like Paradise Island, but when the wind's out and when the rain's out, it can be... um, can be a wee bit bleak. <laughs> I've been there when it's been both, and I much prefer the sunny, nice days. <laughs> Me too, which is why I've been out in the garden today, sorting it out and in a very optimistic mood that I'm going to be drinking martinis out there literally all summer now. One of the first things I try to do when we've got somebody on the show for the first time is just get some background. Tell me about your background in whiskey. Did you have family that uh, was involved in the industry? How did you come to uh, become a distiller? Well, definitely no family involved in the industry, not at all. Uh, my granny likes whiskey. She's from Montrose. That's that pretty much about it. Funny enough, actually, my grandfather uh, bought some shares in the distillery companies. It was called um, the, the Scottish Distillery Shares in the 1930s. And um, they, they've been in the family consistently since then. He died a long time ago. Um, but that actually became the company that I now work for. So I'm, I'm very well versed in, in how well those are doing. Um, so that's that's the only family connection. But um, no, I, I haven't I didn't have any sort of connection to any of this before I thought to do it. In fact, it was never my plan at all. I went to art school to study painting, thinking that's definitely what I wanted to do. I was I knew I wanted to do something creative involving making. Um, and then, of course, got to art school and was pretty bored by a paintbrush quite quickly. Um, two dimensions weren't kind of cutting it. And my work sort of grew out into 
I guess, call them conceptual installations, but I ended up, ended up working in a very sensory way with um, aroma, with sound, with all of these, um, I guess, all of these sensory elements that actually have a physicality to them. So you can't feel them, but you can feel them. Uh, they don't have a sort of um, tangible form, but um, you can uh, you can certainly sense them. And um, that sort of grew into all sorts of interests. And I ended up being a sound engineer, actually, for, for most of my 20s. I studied that and loved it. Very practical physics, um, as it turns out, and a great way to, um, to learn about uh, the application of science um, in a very fun way and, and to make something cool. But um, yeah, I had a, an interest in perfumery always sort of bubbling along in the background and thought that might be something that would be cool to um, get involved with. And then obviously, when you sort of connect whiskey to perfumery and realise you can do all this cool stuff, you know, taking all sorts of weird aromas that you might not find in a commercial perfume, although you probably could now, but 10, 15 years ago when I was getting into this, maybe even longer that, that kind of didn't really exist um, and whiskey was this sort of really abstract interpretation of, of that kind of science and it was really interesting um, and I sort of put it to the side for a bit and just got really into tasting and as a consumer um, so I guess I've been doing a lot of that before I even thought about it as a career and then I guess like lots of people I turned the passion into a into a job um, and ended up at Harriet Watt in my early 30s and I guess hit a gin boom, a, a really sort of a, a time of very positive growth in the industry. So I got a really great set of opportunities to work with distillery build projects, a lot of NPD, all these things that are kind of, you know, they're like getting a, a, about 10 years worth of experience in a very short amount of time. And, um, and you learn so much on projects like that. Um, and here I am. Yeah. So <laughs> that's the background. So how'd you wind up at uh, the old Guinness Power Station in Dublin making Rowan Co.? So I had been working in the UK for an amazing company called Atom Brands um, that did all sorts of cool stuff. Um, it was a brilliant role. Uh, I loved working with the team there. Um, they had all sorts of crazy ideas. It, it allowed me to really go wild with a lot of experimental briefs and work with gin and, um, and RTDs and all these sort of really incredible depth of, of projects. Um, and I got a call uh, out of the blue about this project. And I wasn't really looking for a job at all. Um, but yeah, when you end up in Dublin in this really famous brewery on a street that has so much history in, in terms of brewing and distilling, I can't really think of many streets in the world that have the history that James Street, Thomas Street do in, in Dublin. Um, kind of fell in love with it really. And um, I was very surprised to be offered the role, um, but it was something I couldn't really turn down. And that's how I ended up in Dublin. After having visited the city, I think once previously to go to the airport, I ended up with a bunch of bags and off we went. How hard was it to actually convert the distillery over from a power station? Because I would imagine there was a lot of stuff around there that probably wouldn't have worked real well around stuff that you actually have to drink. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's definitely a challenge. Um I think if anyone has any sort of uh, fanciful ideas about converting a, an Art Deco power station into a distillery, I can probably um, tell you in detail just how difficult it is. Um, the building really dictates what you can do with it. And look, we've only used about a third of, of the footprint of the space. It's huge. Uh, I call it a big cathedral of sort of industry out the back because we've actually left the whole back and, and including two of the original um, turbines. Uh, completely undeveloped so you can sit in the bar look up through the roof lights and out, out the you know, glass doors at the back and just gaze out onto this sort of redundant plant which is quite magical I always say it's a bit like the set of Alien 3 or um, some kind of uh, fabulous sci-fi thriller but um, the reality is it's, it's a massive old building it takes a lot of work uh, to look after it and it took a lot of work to get all, all that kit in there. So the building is very much dictated what we could do with it, but that's also made it quite interesting in, in terms of a project. And we've got all sorts of plant quirks that are really down to where we could put things because we were, you know, obviously couldn't put everything in the order that you'd maybe put things in if you were starting from scratch with a, a, a custom build. So, yeah, that's why I've ended up with things like fin fans on the roof, um, some very cool cooling loops. Um, that do all sorts of brilliant things with um, 
uh, that actually can help us innovate as well. I mean, all, all of these things are unique to building a distillery in an urban environment too. But yeah, we've ended up with a lot of kits, very contemporary, um, this beautiful old building, everything in sort of different pockets of the building. So it's an interesting plant to run. How's that letting you innovate uh, for future Row and co-releases? So we always knew that we wanted to um, have the flexibility to create different styles of spirit here and obviously this is Irish whiskey and part of the tradition of Irish whiskey is these very unique uh, whiskey categories that they're not something new and disruptive as I always say this is something very traditional to Irish whiskey um, so we we built from the off the capability to use uh, different cereals I've got a cereal intake downstairs that you know, spirals off the mill that allows us to take in little bags as well as bigger bags and then I've still got the silo out the back so we've got a lot of flex in terms of what we bring in and how we use it that's first up in terms of the actual kit and the distillery is very traditional uh, it looks very traditional I mean we're talking about really technology that hasn't changed largely in hundreds of years but the cool thing about working in, in the middle of a city, obviously, we, we always have to think about sustainability. We've designed this distillery to be very sustainable from the ground up. And because of that, and as a result of that, we've, we've added these um, very cool cooling loops. So we're actually using glycol and some fin fans on the reef, which you don't see uh, from the street. But um, if I ever am allowed to give technical tours again, I would show you. Um, they're very, very cool. And they allow us to chill down our cooling water to within 0.1 of a degree of, of our desired temperature. And that means I can work with you know, fermentation profiles in wooden wash bags that ordinarily I might not be able to have so much control over. So I can effectively use a very traditional fermentation vessel as, as something um, you know, much more contemporary, which is very, very cool because I'm a massive fermentation enthusiast. You mentioned uh, your art background and trying to... Uh work in three dimensions. How does that translate into making whiskey that uh, has taste and flavor in three dimensions? Very much. Um, I, I've spoken a lot about this, but you know, we're talking about, I guess, chemistry as a sculptural language. It, I mean, it sounds crazy, but if you look around you, even seeing where you are at the minute, look at everything on your desk, on the wall, on the floor, and all of it is a result of a chemical process. And the fact that all of this physicality around us is the result of chemistry is a very sculptural. I mean, it's classical sculpture in its uh, purest form. So for me, it is very much that. Um, we're looking to create these little blocks of flavour in terms of different spirit characters, different fermentations. And I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But um, we, we're creating, I guess, like a spice rack of building blocks and then get to remix them and, and rejig them and rearrange them afterwards so I do think about this very uh, very much from a sculptural perspective um, painting perspective but whatever you, you bring to it personally I think lots of people think like that but for me it's, it's very much that at its heart and I think conversely science for me is a very creative language scientific methodologies often involve these creative leaps to, to think of new ways to do things and, and they're inherently creative so I'd like to take the didactic um, nature of sort of art versus science out of it. And actually, they're, they're so much more closely related than that. Tell me about the relationship you have with Caroline Martin, your uh, master blender, because Rowan Co. is one of the few distilleries where you not only have a female distillery manager, but a female blender. Does that add something different to the whiskey or to the collaboration? Well, I think what it adds to, to the whiskey is Caroline's 30 years of experience in, in the whiskey industry, which is, I, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty important uh, and experiences everything with blending. Um, and Caroline is an industry legend. Um, we also knew that she worked a little bit with, with Bushmills in the past. Um, so she had a bit of experience with Irish whiskey, um, exactly the right uh, lady for the job. And actually her, genius brief in terms of the spirit character that we're um, aiming for at the moment in the distillery for the blends um, for the blend I guess the whiskey we're laying down for the future of the blend that comes from Caroline and we're actually chasing two very distinct spirit characters which we're then um, obviously fermenting distilling entirely separately but marrying up at a very specific ratio in the SRWV warehouse back at the distillery and that's you know, working with blending before the spirits even left site and before we've even thought about wood. 
Uh, that's what blending is. I mean, blending goes right back to the start of the process, ultimately. And that's what Caroline has lent to it. Her oversight has been integral to the project. And it's only a pleasure to work with somebody who's so experienced and as brilliant. You mentioned maturation. Obviously, there's not much room for warehousing on site in terms of maturation warehouses, right? Well, we're not actually allowed to mature uh, whiskey on site. Can you believe it? I mean, the I can because because of various uh, whiskey related accidents that happened in Dublin, nobody is actually allowed to, to mature spirit in, in the city. So um, you know, all of the distilleries here are all in the same position. We all have to send our distillery out with uh, Dublin to, to mature. Warehousing in the Irish whiskey industry is at a premium, so we take what we can get. Uh, but we do have a very, very cool custom uh, spirit tanker that we built especially for the project. It's a little mini one because we've got a steep hill at the back of the distillery. So we have a, a very unique tanker that takes our, our spirit offsite to be filled into a mixture of refill and first fill ASBs for the mainline um, blend. But also, obviously, we're doing a ton of other experiments with different types of oak and different types of wood. So what can you tell me about product development? Well, we've definitely got some uh, very cool wood projects that are in the offing. Um, some interesting collaborations um, with an, uh, an, an island specificity. Um, we actually laid down at the end of last year some uh, really interesting uh, beer cask finishes. Um, one of my favourite things that we've worked on in, in the last couple of years was the Citra IPA cask. Um, and it was super cool because we ended up with a bit of Britannomyces in the wood itself. So it's got this really unusual profile. You've got the hops and then you've got the brett and it's that is just a lovely whiskey. Um, tons more projects coming up and obviously there's, there's things with yeast there's things with mash bills um, as you'd expect um, it's all very very uh, very rosy put it that way when are we going to start to see the spirit from the distillery in a bottle when are you going to start mixing it into the blend so we have um, mature spirit in just over a year's time. So, so we laid, laid down our first spirits uh, from the distillery in May 2019. Um, quite when we're going to start feeding that into the blend, I don't know. Um, when it's ready, um, we don't have to rush it. Um, I, I would not want us to do that. Um, so the quality's right. Um, who knows? That's certainly the intention. When are we going to see a Guinness cask? <laughs> Obviously, you're part of the uh, the Guinness family in the neighborhood. You're part of the uh, St. James's Gate complex. When are we going to see a, a Row & Co. Guinness cask? Well, do you know what? We, we did release last year um, a uh, an Antwerp and Stout uh, cask finish, which was absolutely delicious. Um, I haven't, certainly haven't laid down any, any Guinness casks yet, but who knows in the future that I wouldn't discount it. It's, um, it's not something on the horizon right just yet, but um, yeah, clearly it sounds like it would be a delicious project. And on that note, uh, the distillery is still closed to the public right now, but being part of that complex, I would imagine you have the opportunity at least to attract a lot of visitors when it is open because of the fact that it is part of the, uh, the Guinness St. James's Gate complex with the Guinness Storehouse tours, right? So we're actually, well, I mean, the storehouses, I mean, they can take a lot of visitors every day. Um, we're sort of completely the opposite. We've got very small groups and we're actually quite limited um, in terms of the space that we can offer. So whilst we'd love to have every guest that's been to the storehouse, we actually, we physically couldn't accommodate all of them. So um, yeah, look, I mean, it's part of uh, part of the site, uh, but it's also part of a, a rich neighbourhood of lots of distilleries too. Um, our neighbours next door at Pierce Lyons, down the road, obviously, we've got Teeling, Dublin Liberties. You know, there's, there's already a fantastic distillery caught us. So, you know, I think in terms of, of visitors, it's very much a whiskey destination on its own. And that's where I was heading next, because as you mentioned, all those uh, colleagues in the neighbourhood, how well do you guys all work together? I know that uh, there is a community within the whiskey industry and a collaboration of sorts, or at least friendliness, but uh, how well are you guys all working together knowing that you're also all competitors? So I think um, this is a very close-knit part of Dublin. And you know, even if we don't say it openly, we're all rooting for each other. Uh, like this is the whiskey industry too. That's what this is all about. Um, I see wins in Irish whiskey is like reflecting on all of us as a whole. 
What did you learn in this project in getting the distillery online that you didn't know before? And what was your biggest mistake? Oh, goodness me. Um, well, look, I think in terms of what did you not know before, I think every project I've worked on that's involved putting something new in, there's always a quirk that you hadn't um, you hadn't sort of preempted or you hadn't imagined was it was going to happen. So I think that's just, you, you come to expect that. I could say I hadn't predicted how many late nights I'd spend in the distillery, but that would be a total lie. I knew that would happen. We, we had some late nights commissioning. They were all tons of fun. Um, probably the the hill in the back of the distillery. I, I don't think um, I don't think I predicted that that we'd have to do so much to um, to manage access that way. But we've managed to solve all those issues. We've built a custom spirit tanker to do the job for us. No, I think every build has its quirks, and those are the joys of the project. Um, would I do it again? Absolutely. So I guess the last question is, what does an Irish whiskey distillery manager do on St. Patrick's Day? Oh, I love that question. Well, actually, I did have the day off, but I ended up doing some gardening, um, took some work calls and emails and ended up doing, uh, doing a tasting in the evening with a, with a hotel in London. So um, I wasn't actually at the distillery, but I kind of was still working and I had a Guinness and I did, I did have a large whiskey later. As you should. Laura Hemi is one of at least three women running distilleries in Ireland right now. Lisa Ryan is the manager at the Royal Oak Distillery in County Carlow, while Jennifer Nickerson founded Tipperary Boutique Distillery with her husband and runs its day-to-day -day distilling operations. By the way, I say at least three, because with new distilleries opening in Ireland almost every month or so, there's a good chance I might be missing one or two other women in distillery management roles. If I am, please let me know. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by the Distillers Edition collection lineup of single malts from Diageo's Classic Malts. Look for the new 2020 editions of Oban, Talisker, Lagavulin, Craganmore, Dalwini, and Glenkinchy at a whiskey shop near you and get all the details at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Tasted a few Irish whiskeys this past week around St. Patrick's Day, including the Glendalough Irish Oak Finish Pot Still Whiskey. This one started out in ex-bourbon barrels before being finished in Irish oak casks from trees felled near the distillery in County Wicklow. There is no age statement, it's bottled at 43% ABV. The nose is aromatic and unique with touches of old leather, shoe polish, milk chocolate, and toasted caramel. The taste starts off subtly, then comes alive with spicy notes of clove, cinnamon, and allspice, balanced by honey, toasted caramel, charred oak, and dark honey. The finish is long and spicy, with a nice underlying sweetness. Adding water brings out hints of toffee and pears on the nose while smoothing out the rise of the spices on the palate. I'm scoring the Glendalough Irish Oak finish a 93. Kilbegan Traditional is a, well, traditional Irish blended whiskey. It's bottled at 40% ABV. The nose is light, crisp, and sweet with hints of citrus, honey, dried flowers, ginger, and caramel candy. The taste has hints of baking spices, along with ginger, honey, citrus fruits, dried flowers, and straw, while the finish is long with a gentle touch of spice and a nice sweetness. I'm scoring Kelbegan Traditional an 89. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Want to find out how Sagamore Spirit is reviving and evolving the tradition of Maryland-style rye whiskey, including its new tequila cask-finished rye? Well, in-person tastings are available once again at the distillery in Baltimore, but you'll also find a variety of virtual tours, tastings, and other experiences at the Sagamore Spirit website 
And they're offering WhiskeyCast listeners a free virtual guided tasting. Buy bottles from your local retailer, and a Sagamore Spirit teammate will guide you through each product. Visit sagamorespirit.com and use the code WhiskeyCast, all one word, to access them. Please drink responsibly. Bardstown Bourbon Company's second release in its collaboration with California's Pfeiffer Pavitt Vineyards is a 10-year-old sourced Tennessee bourbon finished in Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon casks for 18 months. It's bottled at 50% ABV. The nose is slightly dry and dusty with notes of baking chocolate, caramel candy, and hints of dried fruits. The taste has a nice balance of sweetness, oak, and spices, with baking chocolate and caramel, underneath hints of peppercorns and cinnamon, while a touch of candied oranges lingers in the background. The finish is long and dry with a nice balance. I'm scoring the Bardstown Bourbon Company Pfeiffer Pavit Reserve Cabernet Finish 2 a 92. And finally... Let's go back to Ireland for a minute. Irish Craft Beverages recently launched its Two Stacks brand of Irish whiskies. And while there are a couple of conventional releases in the range so far, what has been getting the most attention is the Dram in a Can release. That's right, Irish whiskey in a can. To be fair, it is a 100 milliliter can, about twice the size of the typical airline size mini bottle. And it is small enough to fit legally into a carry-on 311 toiletries bag, though it might get you some questions at airport security. There's no word on which distillery or distilleries supplied the whiskeys for the Dram in a Can blend, but props to Irish Craft Beverages for canning it at 43% ABV. The nose has notes of ginger, grass clippings, honey, vanilla, and a hint of pencil shavings. The taste starts off light and fruity, followed by a nice burst of spices with hints of clove, ginger, and allspice. There is a slight nuttiness, along with a hint of oak balanced by apples, honey, and straw. The finish? It's long and gentle with a nice balance. I have to admit that I'm surprised by this one. I had expected a lot less. I'm scoring the Two Stacks Dram in a Can Irish Whiskey a 90. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these whiskeys to our searchable list of nearly 3,100 different whiskeys from all over the world. You can check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Small batch. How would you describe it? It's like an Irishman's understanding of baseball. Extremely limited. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. A couple of weeks ago, Tosh McGill mentioned Waiheke Distillery's upcoming whiskeys during our discussion about New Zealand whiskey. The folks at Waiheke responded on Instagram. Thank you for the mention at Tosh McGill and at WhiskeyCast. As mentioned, we're very excited to build up to our first commercial releases this year, and we would love to share a dram with you on Waiheke Island next time you visit New Zealand. Thanks for the note, and I hope to make that happen this time next year if our friends at Whiskey Galore in Christchurch are able to hold Tramfest 2022. I mentioned on social media last week that Bladnock is exporting its 700 ml bottles of the 2017 Bicentennial Edition single malt to the U.S., which makes it one of, if not the first, official distillery bottling coming to the U.S. in a 700 ml bottle. The price set some people back, though. $7,550 each. Crusader, at the Ether Man on Twitter, responded, 
For that price point, I'd just fly over and pick up a couple of bottles on a weekend trip. Maybe fit in a distillery tour as well. Well, it's not going to be any cheaper over there, and the distillery's closed to visitors right now. Andrew, also known as Words Pictures Stories, had this comment on the 700 ml bottle size. I was just talking to a brand rep about going the other way. All of their U.S. spirits are in 750s, and they need to repackage before going to Europe. I wonder how long it will take before the economics of doing the packaging once and selling 50 ml less juice make 700s the norm. I would not be surprised at all, Andrew, to see some distilleries doing just that over time once they go through their inventories of empty bottles. It is not as easy as just putting less whiskey in a bottle and changing the label, since there are also requirements on what's called headspace. That's the empty space at the top of a bottle after it's been filled. U.S. federal regulations limit that to 8% of the volume of a bottle. That means any U.S. distilleries that want to make the switch would have to have new 700 ml bottles produced with all of the same custom design elements they're using now. That might make it too expensive for distilleries that are not already filling both sizes of bottles for domestic and export sales. If there's something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, well, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. With the arrival of spring in the Northern Hemisphere, farmers will soon be out in the fields planting this year's crop of barley, along with the other grains whiskey distillers depend on. They'll be deciding just what combination of fertilizers will help generate the most yield of grain per acre. But the choice they settle on may affect how much whiskey distillers can produce from that grain down the line. It all depends on a single element that's quite common in nature and commonly used in fertilizers, nitrogen. Nakdu distillery manager Gordon Bruce and his team make the Anak single malt scotch, and Gordon was my guest on this week's Friday Night Happy Hour webcast. Nitrogen is a protein which is non-fermentable, so the, the more nitrogen you have in barley, the less room you've got for starches, which are going to convert into fermentable sugars. We do need some nitrogen in the barley, obviously. It's a, it's a food stuff for our yeasts. So this year, I, I think the stuff we're taking in, with the stuff the, the malt we've taken in this year, the nitrogen is really low. It's good, it's good somewhere about 1.3%. Uh, last year, some of the stuff we see, 1.6%, 1.7%. So it, it doesn't sound a, a big, big difference, but yeah, that, that makes a big difference, the amount of fermentable extract you've got to play with from each grain of barley. So nice low numbers, please. I know that here in the U.S., a lot of farmers will add nitrogen to their soil as fertilizer and to help improve the conditions of the soil. Are farmers in Scotland and in Europe that are doing barley, are they doing that as well? Yeah, same thing over this way, yeah. But very much that depends on weather conditions as well, how the plants are going to uptake that nitrogen, or is it going to get washed through? So the, the, the farmers need to play clever too with the, the weather forecasts and soil conditions before applying fertilizers. Here's an example. Gordon says last year's Scottish barley crop had a clear difference in nitrogen levels, between farms in the northern and southern parts of Scotland. Weather conditions were much better in the north, and the nitrogen levels from that grain were much lower. In the south, conditions were much wetter and cooler, leading to a shorter and wetter growing season in which the crops took on more nitrogen, and that grain wasn't as productive when distilled. The 2019 crop was consistently good, while the 2018 crop was much poorer. Crop vintages are not as critical in whiskey as grape vintages are to winemakers, 
but don't be surprised if you see more whiskey makers specifying the crop year on labels in the future. Brook Laddie already does that with some of its releases, especially those using barley grown on Isla. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. The tears of Ireland's great writers bursting with flavour, humour and angst. Bottled for you to taste. No writers were harmed in the making of this premium Irish whiskey. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of past episodes going all the way back to 2005. We love to hear from you. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. At Doers, we love a good story, and that's why we're always writing new chapters. Like our Caribbean Smooth Whiskey finished in rum casks, or Illegal Smooth finished in mezcal casks. As a 174-year-old brand, we could rest on our laurels. Instead, we'd much rather continue writing. Because when you keep telling the same old story, that's when people stop listening. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. People never forget the person who introduced them to Redbreast. And then those people go on to introduce others to Redbreast. And soon the flock has grown exponentially. It's like a pyramid scheme. Without any of the bad stuff, of course. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2021. And comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.